Liturgy and Sacraments, video four. Liturgy and the real presence of Christ. In Catholic apologetic culture, you hear people talk all the time about the real presence, about the real presence, about the real presence. And I just want to make a very important point, and that is that we're doing theology now. And one of the things you got to do in theology always is define your terms. And the the term, the phrase, real presence, is not a precise theological term. It's not an official doctrinal dogmatic term in Catholic magisterial teaching. It's a popular term, and it actually didn't even arise within Catholic life exactly. Back in the 19th century, there was a revival in the Church of England, an Anglo-Catholic revival. John Henry Newman was part of that before he became Roman Catholic. But it was trying to recover the Catholic dimension and the sacramentalism and an idea that the Eucharist is more than just a remembrance, that Christ is really present, that the bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ. Now, Anglican Catholics, Anglo-Catholics, um, the people who consider themselves Catholic, they're Anglican, but they consider the Anglican Church as a branch of the Catholic Church. That movement, that high church movement, um, used the term real presence. To, it was a battle cry. They were fighting for a return to a deeper Eucharistic theology, more realistic Eucharistic theology. So it became a term really arising out of apologetics um, of people insisting that the Eucharist was more than a symbol, um, not just a symbol, and that it was really the body and blood of Christ. Okay, so that's awesome. Uh, I mean, that's a, that's a great cause, of course, but here's the point I'm just trying to make. It's rather imprecise. And so we need to take a look at this a little bit more closely, all right? The fathers of the Second Vatican Council, remember there are 2,000 bishops there assembled with all sorts of advisors, and there were two popes involved, John XXIII, Paul VI. But the fathers of the council and the popes of the council, they had two very significant, clear, conscious objectives in the teaching on the liturgy. Number one is they wanted to widen the appreciation of Catholics as to the various ways that Christ is really present in liturgical life. Okay, so they wanted to broaden our idea of Christ's presence. But at the same time, and this is important, it's at the same time, they wanted to heighten our appreciation of the unique way that Christ is really present in the Eucharist and in the Eucharist alone. So they had both ideas, both motives, both goals in mind as they taught and as they elaborated their teaching. Okay, so Paul VI, right after the Second Vatican Council, wrote a very important encyclical called Mysterium Fidei, the mystery of faith on the Eucharist. And his words there were quoted in the catechism. So I'm going to re read them to you right now. This presence is called real by which it is not intended to exclude the other types of presence as if they could not be real too. Now he's talking about the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist but because it is presence in the fullest sense. Okay, the Eucharistic presence, as we're going to see in a minute, is the fullest experience that we can have in this life of Christ's presence. It's the fullest way that he is present. All right, but he's really present in many other ways, particularly in the liturgy. All right, so we want to hold both those things together with great reverence and appreciation and not make them a war, you know, and, and many times this is the way it works, you know. In theology, there are paradoxes, right? And you learn this in Catholic theological tradition. And we human beings don't like tension. We don't like paradox. We're always trying to simplify things and, and make things either or. But in the Catholic Church and in the truth about God, so many times it's both and. And the both and are held in tension. Like Jesus is man fully human and fully divine. That's hard. God is one and three. That's hard. It would be a lot easier to just say three gods or there's one God. 
um, or that, you know, there's one God and the other two are not equal to him. You know, it's just really hard for us. So with the presence of Christ, we want to say, yeah, he's either really present in the Eucharist or he's present everywhere. We don't need the Eucharist. No, it's not that. So it's really important to get this straight. Okay, so let's examine this for a minute. The modes of Christ's real presence. Christ is divine. Now, one of the properties of divinity is that God is spirit and God can be present everywhere at the same time. That's unique to God and spirit. Now, the word that is united to the humanity of Jesus Christ is still spirit. And he is still everywhere at the same time. As Christ was dying on the cross, the word was holding the universe together through which the word was made. Now, see, this is a very incomprehensible thing for us. It's a mind boggling thing. But the point is that Christ is divine. And so as in his divinity, all things together, God's mind, which is incarnate in Jesus of Nazareth, his word is that through whom everything is made and in whom everything holds together in, in nature. So this is like mind boggling. Okay. But Jesus is at the same time fully man and his humanity. And this is taught by Thomas Aquinas. It's just philosophical axiom. Even though his body is risen, it's still a human body that is risen. We don't understand all the properties of a resurrected body. I'm looking forward to finding out one day. But right now, we have scripture to go on and a little bit of, of, of reasoning. And one of the things that is very clear is that anything that's material, even the risen body of Jesus, can't be everywhere at the same time. So the, Jesus, his humanity is at the right hand of the Father. His historical risen human body is at the right hand of the Father. His physical risen human body is there. Where that is, we, we don't know, but we will see him face to face one day. So his humanity is present to us sacramentally in only one and very unique way, and that is through the sacred species, through bread and wine that are no longer bread and wine, but are transformed in the act of consecration into the body and blood of Christ. That's, this is the only place that we have, we can touch and receive his humanity, receive his touch in a tangible way. So we'll talk more about that later. So anyway, this is, this is only, this is the uniqueness of the Eucharistic presence. So the Lord is really present in his divinity many places. He's really present in his fullness, in his humanity and divinity, only in the Eucharist. So that's getting a little bit more precise about the real presence. But let's get back to this. In the liturgy, the Lord is really present in at least five ways that go beyond his presence everywhere, anywhere, anytime that we seek him in prayer alone, privately, or where two or three are gathered in a parking lot or in a, by a hospital bed. In the liturgy, there are five more intense, more powerful ways that he is present. First of all, in the praying and singing assembly. Now, I'm taking this right from Second Vatican Council and from the Catechism. You have the references in your outline, okay? In the praying and singing assembly, which is the, the, this, the members of the body of Christ who make present the whole mystical body. And that's the amazing thing. You walk into Mass on Sunday and there are people there who are daydreaming and they're talking and they're not paying attention and uh, some of them are dressed immodestly and, and other, others seem to be, you know, um, very cross and not very joyful or prayerful. But, you know, the point is you're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. What's really there at Mass is the whole mystical body of Christ. And through that, the head is truly present. This is the teaching of the church. Okay. When the word of God is proclaimed, that is a real presence of the divinity of Christ, who is the word of God. Okay, so there's a real power in the proclamation of the word of God in the liturgical celebration, not just mass, but any liturgical celebration. He's present really in it, by his divinity through the ordained minister who has been configured to Christ and makes his priesthood present, particularly the priest or the, or, or the bishop. Okay, um, Christ is, is really present also in the minister through baptism. You know, it's Christ who baptizes. So even when it's not a priest who baptizes, Christ is present in the minister. The Christ is present in the, in the spouses who minister the sacrament of matrimony to each other. That's a pretty amazing thing. Um, he's present in really in all the sacraments 
not just the Eucharist, in his divinity. And he's really present, most especially, of course, as we just mentioned, in the Eucharist, the fullest, most complete presence. But I, the point here, I think, is we got to get a sense of the magical, in a certain way, mystical, powerful moment of liturgical prayer anytime it occurs. And uh, I think it'll enrich you really uh, in a great way if you use your imagination in liturgical prayer to help you with this. I'll just give you an example. When I go to Mass, um, I do my best before Mass to kind of compose the place. And if I'm fortunate enough to get there early as I tried to do for a few minutes, I just imagine the floor as a sea of glass and underneath the floor bearing us up are angels and uh, the, the ceiling is glass. And out there, as I look above, um, I see the smiling faces of saints in jubilation. And, and we're just entering into this reality of the angels and saints worshiping. They're there with us, we're with them at the right hand of the Father. That, that's an amazing thing to contemplate. But that's also true, really, in liturgical prayer. When I do the Magnificat uh, in evening prayer, we're gonna talk about this later, I see myself praying with Mary. I see her by my side. I see her smiling face as she says, my soul magnifies the Lord. And I join her. And I know that Joseph, although it's not his prayer, he makes it his prayer. It's the prayer of the whole church. So I see many others singing with me when we do the Magnificat, or we do the, the Benedictus in morning prayer. At nighttime, um, I, I think of the angels uh, in heaven worshiping him. Um, and I know they're going to worship and I actually tell them, I know you guys are going to, you guys can handle, I'm going to sleep now. I can't pray after I finish Compline, but saints and angels keep glorifying him. And tomorrow I'll join back in. And I just kind of imagine, I use my imagination to make myself conscious of the present that I'm plugging into this mystical reality whenever I pray liturgy. I pray Compline typically just uh, as my head hits the pillow. I pray a lot of times with my wife right there in bed. We pray Compline. Sometimes we pray it as a family all together. Um, but uh, lots of times it's just me and my wife lying in bed before we turn the lights out. We pray Compline together. But we call to mind that we are entering into this magnificent reality of Christ's real presence and our unity with the mystical body.